Well, I'm joined now by Philip Yancey, Christian author and speaker. And it's great to be talking to you again, using uh, all of this technology that enables us these days to link up across the ocean, Philip. Uh, what does lockdown look like for you just at the moment in, in your part of Colorado? Well, Colorado is a great place to experience lockdown because uh, there are a lot of open spaces. We take walks. It's about the only place you can get exercise these days. And we've got very pure air. So it's easy to keep social distance when there are so few people in such a big state. And for an introverted writer, my life is about the same. You know, I, I sit in my office and click on a keyboard all day. Uh, I, I have a clearer calendar now than I've had in a long time. Every event, every trip has been canceled through October. And so I have to figure out, I, I need to start writing. I need to find something, some new project to dive into because I have an unexpected big hunk of time. That's yeah, well, well you're, you're experiencing that both as, a, I suppose, a, a challenge and a blessing in, in many ways. But yes. um, have, have you been asked to write anything either long or short form on this present coronavirus crisis? Well, I've, I've done uh, some blogs just on my own uh, Facebook and website. But I've been doing interviews like this. Uh, had one last night with the Washington National Cathedral, this huge church, kind of the, almost the state church of, uh, of the United States. And I was supposed to go there and speak. And instead, uh, that got canceled the day before I went. So uh, we're, we're doing the best we can. Churches all over are, are using technology to try to fill in with what they can't do on a regular basis. Absolutely. And we'll talk a little bit about the church response in a moment. But what, what do you make uh, at this point of, of how the USA has dealt with this crisis, both at a, a local level in terms of the way states and individual regions are, are handling it, but also, I suppose, at a national level with the, the White House leadership and so on? It depends on what network you're watching. If you watch <laughs> CNN, you get one view. If you watch Fox News, you get an entirely different view. Uh, I don't know if you get Fox over in, in Britain. but Well, we certainly it. see the news feeds and, and the very different yeah, versions of events that come through those. Right, right. And it, you know, I, I have a lot of sympathy for the, the leaders, both the scientists and the politicians, because it's a tricky balance. Um, you, you want to have a, a spirit of hope and a spirit of optimism. And at the same time, there's that realism that we really are in, a, in the midst of a crisis. We need to avoid any social contact as much as possible. That's the only way to control it. And um, President Trump himself uh, has shifted course just in the last few days where he was the cheerleader saying, oh, we'll get over this thing. And, and now he's, he's, I think, started listening to the scientists and realized that despite the um, enormous disruption in the entire country and the entire world, it's something that we need to just bite hard and take the medicine and get through it. Yeah, I, I suppose the problem so often in, in the highly politicized environment in the USA is that these issues become just as politicized and, and used as a, a weapon from one side against the other. Are you seeing a lot of that going on? Is it, are people starting to try and work together more than they were before now? I, I would say yes. I've seen a, a lot of, well, the good stories, you know, the stories of the Italians and the Spanish standing on their balconies uh, here in Denver, Colorado, where I live, every night at eight o'clock in the, in the downtown area, people come out on their balconies and, and howl. <laughs> they, that's what they're doing. They're howling in support of the, of the nurses and, and health service workers. Okay. And it's, you know, there is that, that feeling that we, we've got to pull together. This is a, a common enemy that we all face. There's nobody to blame. And we have to somehow pull together and get through it. A little bit like maybe uh, London experienced during the Blitz. Yeah, I think that's the closest equivalent that we can think of at this point to the way, to the kind of community spirit that often comes out of these sorts of things, despite difficult circumstances. And in, in my experience, these sorts of crises bring out both the, the best and worst in humanity. And I, I'm sure you've seen at your end the, the stockpiling and the panic and the so on. But equally, you know, many acts of kindness and generosity that, that it, you know, right. producers in people. Right. Yeah. I remember, um, I remember reading a survey of elderly Britons, uh, Londoners, and 60% of them th uh, said that their favorite time in life was during the Blitz. 
Yeah. For a while there, there were 3,000 people a day being either killed or wounded, like a 9-11 attack every day going on. Mm. And yet, as they look back, what they remembered was huddling together in, in the tube, being visited by royalty, uh, singing the patriotic songs. You know, we're, we're, we're going to survive one way or another. And I, I do sense some of that spirit in um, the United States and different places around the world. Uh, and what sort of response do you see happening from Christians and churches in the USA? There are always the, the prophets who immediately want to cast blame. You know, that was true back when you had the plague in Britain. There would be these prophets going up and down saying, this is God's judgment, God's judgment. And what they really needed was some rat poison. <laughs> they didn't understand that. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I just find it so dismaying when, Christian leaders start blaming China or Korea or some crazy conspiracy theory, you know, and fortunately that doesn't, it, it gets a little press in the media because they like to make religion look bad, but it doesn't reflect at all the mainstream response of churches. I think uh, churches are just scrambling to do what they can to keep the connection going, you know, not, not let it just disintegrate because uh, you've got empty buildings. You, it's it's against the rules now to gather together. So fortunately, with technology, we have ways of reaching people. And um, there again, there are so many stories of of churches who are trying to organize and reach out with food banks and support for the elderly. You know, showing up outside of an elderly home with a choir to sing. You know, those kind of things. Uh, Six feet apart, of course, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. um, it's, I think in, in general, the church is trying to, the best they can, be that word of comfort and hope, which is what we're called to do. Yeah, I, I can imagine it, it's especially a challenge, though, for those churches where the gathering is such an integral part. And, and I think this is challenging all churches to, to think outside the box in that sense of, of how they do church. Uh, and I can imagine that's almost a, a bigger challenge for some of those mega church sort of models where it is all, all around that huge Sunday gathering. And obviously for the foreseeable future, that's not going to be happening for, for most of those places. Right. But on the other hand, for instance, just last night, I did this program with the National Cathedral, this huge church. And it was, it was a living room setting. I was sitting in this very chair in my office. The dean was not collared. He was sitting with an open neck shirt in his yeah. office at home. And we were talking directly as if we had a small group in front of us. And in, in some ways that replicates more of how the early church uh, existed. Just they, they started as house churches. There weren't the buildings. In fact, they were kind of huddled down with this enemy, <laughs> the Roman empire against them. It, it, it recreates some of that spirit and the mega churches also have the ability to do these beautiful programs. Uh, one that I've been watching regularly here in Denver, they, they have uh, videos with drones. And I mean, they, it's, it's quite a show to yeah, watch yeah. their worship service in the morning. Uh, I go to a little church with about 60 people, maybe closer to <laughs> what most of you experience in the UK. And we miss that personal contact, of course. Sure. The main reason we go is not for entertainment. It's not for qu the quality of the experience. It was, it's for the community, mm. the people we care about. And you miss that. There are ways, like we're doing now, to connect electronically. But it, I hope people don't get used to the sitting around in their bathroom <laughs> drinking coffee and experiencing that as church. You know, it's, yeah. it's not. That's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. It, it's it's a kind of it's a necessary thing at the moment, but we don't want it to become the norm. Though I, I guess I guess the question is, in what ways will this whole experience? I mean, it'll change the world in some ways. I, I've no doubt for for in the short term. But but how do you think it might change the church and the the way we approach? I suppose are there any good things that that might ultimately come out from this in in the way that the church reaches people? Well, there are good things, and I'm glad you brought up that, uh, that question, because I believe that's the main thing that the Bible says about pain and suffering. It, it, doesn't, it, it really doesn't give answers to why it happens. I mean, even God, when he was speaking to Job, ignored that question. 
And Jesus, when he came across people who were going through hard times, the Pharisees and his own disciples always wanted to blame somebody. You know, tell, tell us the, the theory behind this. Why is it happening? Why was that man born blind? Why did the tower fall on these people? Mm -hmm. Jesus ignored that question and always turned it to the bystanders. Uh, would you be ready if a tower fell on you? Mm -hmm. And the, for me, it's, it's turning the from looking backwards, why did this bad thing happen? What is the cause of it? To what is our response? Now what? What, what can we learn from it? And in my own experience, I've, I've written about this. I had a, um, an experience about 10 years ago where I was in, involved in an accident. My car went off an icy road, went down a cliff, turned over and over five times. I ended up with a broken neck. And as it turned out, I had about seven hours strapped to a backboard, couldn't move, strapped yeah. down. And actually I, I dug it out the other day and, and then I had to wear this neck brace for God. 12 weeks, you know? <laughs> and, and when I was lying there, I thought uh, this could be the end of my life. The doctor said, we've got a jet standing by to fly you to Denver. But frankly, if indeed one of your arteries has been nicked by a bone fragment, you're not going to make it to, Den to Denver. You, you may only have a few minutes or at most an hour to live. And you know, that's a wake up call, you start thinking. And I, I did start thinking and I thought, uh, of all the things that I could spend my last hour of life reflecting on, I could only come up with three. Who do I love? Who, who, am God, who would I call on that cell phone? Who will I call? Who do I love? What have I done with my life? Am I pleased as I look back? Have I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish? And am I ready for whatever is next? And that could be death. Am I ready for death? Or the rest of my life? How should it be different? As we, and I, I hope that we use a time like this as a reflective time. We've got more time, most of us, because there are a lot of things we can't do. I hope we unplug. Don't sit around just listening to the scary news and watching the charts of deaths and infections going up, but truly use it as a time of, of reflecting. That is, I think, the, the pattern that the New Testament gives us. You know, we, people can put up with a lot of pain and suffering if they feel there's something productive coming out the other end. How many times have you, have you known a woman who goes into the hospital and has a baby and she says, I will never go through that again. <laughs> but then they're back in a few years with another baby. Why do they do that? Well, a lot of times when you go to the hospital, you leave something behind. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in this case, in the maternity ward, you take something home with you. Yeah. Mm. And, and you'll endure it for the good that can come. And that uh, is the pattern I see in all the passages in the New Testament. They're, they're about what suffering can produce. Patience, perseverance, hope, character, those kinds of things spelled out in books like Romans and First Peter. And, and so I think that that is a message that the church can give. It's not, suffering is not wasted time. In fact, it's, it's, it's a way to get our attention. I remember, I, as you may know, I wrote a few books with Dr. Paul Brand, a British surgeon who worked in India with leprosy patients. And he would say, that a healthy body is not a body that feels no pain. In fact, he said, my, you know, that's, that's the problem with my leprosy patients. They don't feel pain, so they damage themselves. Mm -hmm. A healthy body is a body that attends to the pain of the weakest part. And that's what we should be doing right now. We, who are followers of Jesus, we believe we're the body of Christ. We are the physical representation of God in this world. That's a scary mission, but that's what we're called more than two dozen times in the New Testament, Christ's body. And for that body to be healthy, we need to be attending to the pain of the weakest part. It's been great to talk through some of these issues with you. Uh, thank you so much, Philip. Um, again, prayer has been a frequent subject that you've written on. How, how are you praying yourself at this point in time? I pray every day for the people who are making these very difficult decisions and who are out on the front lines. In the United States, uh, every day there's been a press conference led by some of the top doctors who are trying to bring realistic approach and, and tell the truth to the, to the nation. 
we happen to have a devout Christian as head of our National Institutes of Health. His name is Dr. Francis Collins. He headed up the Human Genome Project. Mm. He wrote a book about his turn from atheism to faith, to faith called uh, The Language of God. And I pray, I pray for Dr. Collins, the enormous challenges he faces, just trying to get ventilators and protective equipment to the right places and the hot spots breaking out in this city and that state. And, and to keep his employees motivated, these, uh, there, there are thrilling stories. New York is, is our real hot spot. And just the other day, 12,000 retired nurses volunteered to join because they, they were so needed. They know the risks. They know that they're exposing themselves to infection, but 12,000 of them. I mean, mm -hmm. these are our heroes. These are our heroines. And uh, I pray for them. And of course, pray for the churches. I pray for so many organizations, missions, because fundraising is taking a huge hit as the economy does. And in a crisis like this, you know, nobody's thinking about uh, digging wells in Africa or, you know, these are freeing mm -hmm. sexual trafficking in India or something mm -hmm. like that. They're thinking about the coronavirus COVID-19, that's, yeah. that's all that's on the news. And we, we must not forget the good work that the body of Christ is doing around the world. And they need our support probably now more than ever. Yeah. Perhaps as we close, would you pray yourself, Philip, and uh, for both for those international issues, but also for those things closer to home where people are feeling anxious or afraid in this present crisis? I will. I will. Gracious God, we, we tend to experience these crises in terms of charts and statistics, but actually suffering doesn't come like that. It comes in person, affecting a family, losing a spouse, having a, a child or an elderly parent in a hospital that you can't even go to visit. And I pray for those who are going through hard times. I pray that they won't try to do it alone. We are one body, and I pray that we would be honest about our vulnerability and our needs and our loneliness and our isolation and reach out the best we can with the technology we have available and look to the churches for support. Look to our small groups, if we have them, our pastor, staff like that. And I pray for those who are on the front lines, who are showing us true courage and for those who have to make the very difficult decisions. I pray, God, that a year from now, as we look back, although there will be grief and sadness and, and tragedy, that we would see that the, the, we faced an invisible enemy as an entire global community. And it brought us together in a different way. Some of the divisions that were so important weren't so important anymore. And I pray that the church would emerge as a beacon of comfort and hope. You put us here on earth to do that, to bring words of comfort and hope. The gospel is good news. And I pray that we would convey that good news at a crisis time. Thank you that we have the confidence that you are in control. And you, you said in times of crisis to be still and know that you are God. May we do that too. And rest with calmness and assurance that you are in control and there will be another day. May the church emerge even stronger to face that day in your name. Amen.